I recently caught up with Dr. Marcos Bajevic, who has an early view paper in journal of ecology on inferring community assembly processes from functional diversity patterns. Um, my name is Marco Spasujevic. I'm currently a postdoc in Susan Harrison's lab at University of California, Davis, where I'm working on a variety of projects, including exploring functional diversity patterns on serpentine and non-serpentine soils, and a project assessing the potential for cooler microhabitats to act as refugia for species in the face of climate change. Um, I did my PhD with Catherine Suding at University of California, Irvine, the focus of my PhD was exploring functional diversity patterns in alpine tundra. And I received my undergraduate degree from the University of Washington in Seattle. So you published a paper uh, recently with um, your, your PhD advisor uh, in the Journal of Ecology. And um, so I'll just let you describe it. What, what, what was the main problem you were trying to solve or, or what, what motivated the study? Um, so this project really started with me wanting to understand how the factors that structure communities change along environmental gradients. Mm -hmm. Alpine tundra is sort of really interesting in that you get really strong environmental gradients over really short distances. Like 10 meters, you can have huge changes in productivity, species composition. So I really started with wanting to understand those. And when I initially jumped into the literature, there were sort of these two competing hypotheses of how uh, the factors of structured communities change along gradients. The main one being you know, a shift from abiotic structuring to competition as you move from the stressful end to the more resource rich end, and the other being a shift from below ground competition to above ground competition. And at the time, these were sort of presented as mutually exclusive, but uh, we sort of thought that using functional traits would be a good way to integrate those and allow us to assess these multiple processes at once. And so our second motivation was sort of that um, these classic interpretations of functional diversity really just focused on sort of abiotic structuring and competition and really don't mention facilitation. And we know that's pretty important in the Alpine. So we wanted to try to figure out a way to incorporate facilitation into, you know, exploring patterns of functional diversity. Great. If you could boil down your, your findings from the paper to a couple of main bullet points, what, what would they be? I guess our two main findings is one that uh, sort of multiple assembly processes structure alpine plant communities along a stress resource gradient. At our sort of more harsh environment, it's abiotic structuring for wind and cold and below ground competition. And as we move to the more benign habitat, the shift toward um, above ground competition for light. And our second main finding is that if you looked at just phylogenetic diversity or a multivariate functional diversity index, you wouldn't see all these patterns. And that the individual, looking at individual traits, really gives us a more complete picture of the assembly mechanisms operating. Uh, how general do you think these results are? Um, do you expect them to, to see the same patterns in, in different habitats, different or similar habitats in different latitudes or, or different patterns? Um, I think they're relatively general, and I think um, in some ways. I mean, I think our results that multiple assembly processes are operating simultaneously mm -hmm. is probably relatively general, and it's probably happening in a lot of systems. Mm -hmm. So anything where there's a strong abiotic component, like semi-arid grasslands, there's probably... Um, you know, filtering for water availability, but also some competition going on. Yeah. So the idea that both these are operating is probably pretty widespread. Mm -hmm. um, as far as finding, you know, the same patterns we found, I think probably in a lot of tundra habitats we'd see something similar, but as we move into a more benign environment, you probably see less of the abiotic structuring and more of a um, importance of competition. Right. In the discussion you recommended uh picking traits carefully, and so I, I sort of it made me think of a potential trade-off where if you, if you uh, pick traits carefully, then you run the risk of potentially biasing your results. Um, but then again, if you do the, you know, a fishing expedition, as they say, and just measure everything you can, that, that doesn't seem ideal either. So, um, so, so what, I mean, what are your thoughts on picking traits? Um, I definitely think it's important to pick trait 
as carefully. I guess there is the potential to be too careful. Mm-hmm. I think really the critical thing to think about is picking multiple traits associated with multiple different processes or different resources. Right. I've seen some studies where out of 11 traits measured, eight of them were associated with one process. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they find evidence for that process. Right. And so sort of balancing your traits between different processes is probably where you want to be careful. I think it allows, like, if you really don't know the system that well, you can pick a whole suite of different assembly mechanisms or resources and a few traits associated with each one of those that mm-hmm. can give you, you know, some indication of what's going on. There's a whole suite of papers coming out now on this file and community structure stuff. So is, is all that literature um, to just be taken with a grain of salt or...? or uh, no, no, no. I think, um, like, the phylogenetic patterns are still really important. And I think what's useful about them is they sort of integrate over all the traits you measure and all the traits you don't measure. Mm-hmm. And they really give sort of, like, the net effect, so the dominant mechanisms operating. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I think the important thing to consider with looking at phylogenetic diversity and multivariate functional diversity is if you have sort of opposing assembly processes like competition should select for more phylogenetic diversity, mm-hmm. whereas abiotic filtering should select for low phylogenetic diversity. Right. So if you have both of those operating, they're going to sort of balance each other out and you end up somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. And so they may mask sort of the, the patterns that way, you know, of the individual processes that may be operating. So I think it's still really informative, but I think mm-hmm. it's probably most informative if you use it in conjunction with trade analyses. Right. So do you think the utility of the phylogenetic um, structure approach um, depends on scale because uh, in your study it was relatively um, a relatively small scale compared mm-hmm. to some of the other studies like this that are that are out there in the literature. So, is po- I mean, it makes me wonder if phylogenetic approach would be more applicable at a very large scale. Yeah, I think probably if you're getting a lot like huge turnover going from a grassland mm-hmm. to a forest. It's right. probably much more applicable than, mm-hmm. you know, we have a lot of similar forbs that are varying slightly in traits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and what about extending the results to um, highly invaded habitats? I mean, I, I imagine your study sites were relatively pristine. Um, yeah, it's, uh, the alpine tundra has almost no yeah. invasive species. So do you think invasive species would sort of somehow buck these trends in, in some ways? Um, I think there's a potential for that. We've started looking at that um, Mm -hmm. with Susan Harrison. Uh, We're doing a lot of work in California grasslands. Mm -hmm. And in some of our our data sets, we have about 60% of the species are invasive. And it's really sort of swamping the uh, functional diversity patterns. So I think it may really alter what we see on the ground. And so we've started separating out the invasives when we analyze functional diversity, doing it both with and without, and mm-hmm. seeing very different patterns. I, w- I wonder if there's any been any research on this, uh, so sort of the variation among individuals within species in, in, in the functional trait literature. It, yeah, um, there's actually a lot of the literature is starting to push toward integrating intraspecific variability mm-hmm. into the functional trait. Data. Um, I think it's sort of one of the big things missing right now. Mm-hmm. I think as um, more and more of these large trait de- databases are developed for people just to pull data, mm-hmm. there's sort of the potential for um, results that aren't really showing what's on the ground because they're not taking into account sort of variation and plasticity mm-hmm. within these traits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be a really important topic for functional diversity mm-hmm. here soon. Right. That was your... The, the, the research published in the in the paper um, was your PhD research. Are you do you plan to go back and, and do any research there on that question or that system? Um, I would like to get back to working in the Alpine Tundra mm-hmm. at some point in my career. Uh, right now, I've sort of shifted into still staying in mountain environments, but I've been mm-hmm. doing a lot of my work in the Siskiyou Mountains in Oregon. Mm-hmm. It's a slightly different system, not quite as uh, environmentally harsh. Mm-hmm. But it's still pretty interesting. There's a lot more gradients there. Right. And so I've been collaborating with uh, Ellen D- Damshin and Jim Grace to look at um, Whitaker's old sampling plots oh, great. and look at functional diversity patterns there. And there we have gradients of soil moisture, elevation, soil fertility with multiple different soil types. 
uh, tree density. So there we're going to try to look at how all these different factors both directly and indirectly influence functional diversity. But I would still like to get back to the alpine tundra and do some more mechanistic experiments there. What was the most um, challenging part of the study? Um, surprisingly, it was actually the functional diversity analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started this project, there wasn't a really big, a really strong consensus on what metric to use. Mm -hmm. So I actually reanalyzed this data set multiple times as new, better functional diversity metrics came out. Mm -hmm. And so it took a long time to actually finish this just because of all the new different advances and functional diversity metrics. Right. The um, field work in the Alpine is great, and it's basically going hiking up in the mountains every day and can't really complain there. Right. To wrap it all up, uh, what, what do you think are the consequences for the, the field of, of your paper? Um, well, I hope it sort of um, gets people to consider looking at individual trait patterns a little more. Mm -hmm. And uh, while, if, like I said, functional diversity and multivariate functional diversity, or sorry, phylogenetic diversity and the multivariate functional diversity indices are important, they can you know, potentially mask some of the patterns that may be going on. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that it sort of gets people to really consider looking at individual trait patterns and how there may be multiple assembly mechanisms operating. Right. Good.